Robert Kelly is a stand-up comedian who has a recent stand-up special called Kill Box out now that you can access through robertkellylive.com. And he's going to be at Joe Rogan's Comedy Mothership this weekend. That is May 12th and 13th. Not a ton of tickets remaining. For those that are left, you might be able to grab those at comedymothership.com. Robert, thank you so much for the time. How are you doing today? I'm fantastic. It's a beautiful day here in Westchester, Best Chester, New York, and I'm in my shed that the Amish built. You're in a shed, and it's maybe the uh, the nicest looking shed based on uh, lens lighting and uh, whatever the third thing was that uh, that, that the video- lens lighting gear. That's what it is. I know. I'm like they call, they call me the king of Zoom during the pandemic. <laughs> Well, it looks great, and it's uh, going to be exciting to have you back here in Austin this weekend. Uh, you are headlining at Joe Rogan's Comedy Mothership. Uh, you're going to be in the Fat Man Room. I had a chance to uh, check out a couple of shows there. It's a beautiful room. You've actually been up on stage at that club. Uh, what are your initial impressions of uh, Rogan's new place? You know, when when the buzz was that Rogan moved to Austin, he was going to buy a club, and you know, I think the, the, oh, okay. All right. Okay. And then, oh, he bought it. Okay. And then people started talking about it and it was like, what? And then when I went into it, <laughs> dude, it's just the best club. I mean, it's just Rogan didn't mess around. He didn't, he just, he did it. Like everybody, everybody says it. And you're like, yeah, 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 okay. But then you go in there and you're like, oh, this is the this is literally the perfect comedy club. Like every club should be made like that club. I mean, I'm talking from the door guys out front being nice. You know what I mean? Uh, and they know, like I stood out there, look, I don't got an ego. I'm like, I'm just waiting. And they were like, Mr. Kelly. Uh, come right over here. Like they knew who, I don't know if they were fucking in the comedy CIA or what, but <laughs> they were like, come in, you know, just that type of shit. And then they bring you in and you go upstairs and everybody's nice. Nobody's got an attitude. Uh, and you go up into the green room and you're like, it's like the, the perfect green room. It's just a bunch of comics hanging out. And there's just going on stage. Just it reminded me of Boston back in the day when I first we started we were in Boston. There was so many comedy clubs, and there was in even in Knicks, it was upstairs and down, and then the Charles Playhouse, and then the uh, uh, Duck Soup, and then uh, Dick's Comedy Vault. So we would just be hanging, and then uh, I gotta go, and then you go, and then they come back, and it was like a different group of comics hanging out all the time, and that's what it felt like. Comics are just going into the the little room and then going to the big room and then coming up and they have these screens, you know, that show the show. And then this light goes on for that. And you get three minutes and over here you get three minutes. And then there's a tunnel you go through and you walk out on stage and the, the stage is perfect height. And I mean, it's, he really did it. He did it. He really did it. It's, it was pretty wild to uh, see that type of club. In my lifetime. Yeah, bringing over a bunch of people from the comedy store when it was in limbo during the COVID yeah. pandemic, I think was a smart move too. And you're obviously a guy who is familiar with Austin crowds. Robert, you and I spoke a couple years ago. I feel it was I feel like it was when you were here for South by Southwest, or maybe it was another Moon Tower. But you come from Moon Tower. You used to hit up the old Cap City all, all the time. And uh, now you're going to be headlining at the Comedy Mothership this weekend. Is uh, Austin, in your opinion, as somebody who obviously performs all over the country, one of the best cities to get to perform stand-up right now? Well, yeah, man. You know, it's weird. I, I kind of, that hit me. Last time I was here, I came in to do, to promote my, uh, my special uh, that came out. I think in October and I came to do uh Tom and uh his wife the uh my, your mom's house the podcast mm -hmm. and Rogan's podcast that was for the first time and I wound up Rogan asked me to do the Vulcan and uh I went I went there and the place is jammed yeah and the crowd was on fire and they were great 
And then I was talking to the other comedians and I'm like, where is there else to perform? You got Creek in the Cave. You got six other comedy clubs in one town. So it's, you know, it, like I said, it reminds me of Boston when Boston back in the day was the Mecca of comedy. Like Austin became a, you know, the, it has to start with the, like the community, like the comics, you know, and there's a huge comedy community and funny dudes. There's funny comics there. Um, it's like no joke. Like the guys that were on the show at the Vulcan, sometimes you go up and say, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's whatever. It's a local funny guy. These guys murdering. And now you got, when you got people, comics coming into your town to do comedy, like that's what happened in the back of the day. I don't know if you know this, but like uh, Bobcat and Janine and all these comics, they, they, those weren't Boston comics. Boston comics made it so comedy in Boston was the place to be. So people came to be in Boston to work that scene and then got discovered out of Boston. Yeah. And that's kind of what's happening in Austin right now where people are moving there to do comedy, to become a great comic. Cause it's hard, you know, you got to go somewhere, become a great comic, and then you can go to LA and New York and, you know, be the new guy, but you're really not the new guy. You're, you're, you're really a killer, you know? It's hard to like start in New York because people just see you suck, you know? Uh, so like we, me, Patrice, Burr, Cook, we all went to New York as killers from Boston. We were new, but it was like, we're getting on stage and murdering. And that's kind of what's happening in Austin. All those new guys are just murderers, you know? I haven't heard the Boston comp before, but it makes a lot of sense because in New York or even Los Angeles, there's so much else going on. You go there to try and continue honing your stand-up skills, but oftentimes comics are, or at least were, looking for TV deals back in the day. There's so many yeah. other things that can occupy your time, whereas yeah. in Boston back in the day and here in Austin now, it's stand-up and that's it. Obviously, you have live music too, but there aren't the other entertainment industry distractions that exist in New York and Los Angeles. Yeah, New York, you go. there's no industry on, you know, you're not getting discovered in New York. That's yeah, why yeah. You, you're just going there to be a good comic. Hmm. You want to be famous, you would go to L.A. You want to be a stand-up, you would go to New York. Hmm. Um, because, you know, and now now you can go to Austin. Because <laughs> fucking Rogan, you know. It's, <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, Dylan lives there. Uh, Tony lives there. I mean, I know other guys that are planning on moving there. Like, people, <laughs> people want to move to Austin now, which is, is crazy. And I, I mean, to go there, too, I mean, it's a crazy town. Let's yeah. not get, I mean, it's, it's, it's crazy, but it's, it's cool. You know, it's, uh, it's crazy. Cool. You know, um, I don't know. I liked it, man. I had a blast. Moon tower this year was awesome. I had a fun time. All the shows. I mean, dude, all those clubs that do comedy that aren't even comedy clubs, you know, and then you got the theaters. What was it? The state line. I think I did state which side. Yeah. State side, which was insane. You know, what a nice little theater to just to pop in, do a show, it was packed out. Um, the Antones, Antoines, what is it? Antones, yeah. Antones. <laughs> I mean, there's so much, there's so many venues to do stand up. It's it's crazy. If I was if I was a little younger and you know, and if I wasn't married with a kid in school, I would I would think about moving there. And if Rogan bought me a house. I was about to say, what would it take for you to move here? That's what it is. Yeah, if Rogan was like, dude, I'll buy you a house, I'd go. <laughs> uh, so you mentioned having to take your lumps to, to get good at the craft, which is the case for any artistic skill. And oftentimes, young comics get discouraged, but get picked back up by other comics who give words of encouragement, or maybe they provide some praise. Was there a specific comic early in your time as a stand-up that provided that sort of praise that continued to fuel you to uh, to further hone and learn the craft where you have eventually gotten to the point that you are now? Yeah, it was, uh, I think it was, I came up with, you know, like Gary Gullman, yeah. Patrice, Dane, Billy, Bob Marley. And I think the pep <laughs> talk I got was, uh, uh, stop being such a pussy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We, <laughs> From all the we, Boston guys, they just continually said that to you. Look, my my theory is this is if you're a comic, there's people that learn how to do stand-up comedy. 
because it's a job now. Mm -hmm. It's a you can go and make a living doing stand up. You know, you get a hot TikTok page and get a good Instagram following, blah, blah, blah. But then there's people that are funny. They're just funny. Whether they're at a Home Depot or a subway or a train stop, they're funny. They're comedians. They're stand up comics. Yeah. And, you know, I hung out with guys who were meant to do stand up. There's no other alternative, there's no B plan. Yeah, there's no, there's no other thing. So yeah, you get frustrated, you get sick of it, and hundred percent, I've quit a bunch of times. But there's, I can't do anything. This is it. This is my, my first love was stand up. You know, we would drive from Boston in my Honda two eighty Z with Patrice. I couldn't even get into sixth gear because his fat leg was in the way of the shifter. So I would have to drive like in fifth gear the whole way. And uh, oh no, fourth gear. I couldn't get my shit shifted over. And we would drive to New York. We get there early, fall asleep in the car because the show wasn't for three hours. And then we'd wait. And then we'd get bumped by Chappelle and Brewer. And and then we'd go on, do a spot, and drive home. Uh, it's just the the love of the game, you know. It's some people are just meant to be stand up. So is there a yeah? I mean, you know, dude, keep it up. Ew, things will happen. Comics don't, I, I really think comics don't do shit to get famous and don't, to do it and get money. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, it's just to be funny, man. You know, funny. That's it. Are you funny? It doesn't matter if you're a guy. I know a lot of fucking millionaires that aren't funny, but you know, they made a lot of money being funny, doing comedy. Um, but, yeah. but I know a lot of, I know a lot of thousandaires that are the funniest motherfuckers walking the earth. You know what I mean? Um, yep. Yeah, so. I feel you there too, because I'm I'm a lifelong radio guy. Right. And despite the fact that unlike comedy, which is going through, I don't know if you call it a re renaissance, but it's in a very good place right now, kind of in response to all the, the woke BS from these last few years. And people were not only railing against that, but wanting to hear people talk about serious issues and be able to have fun with it. Uh, so radio is not that, unfortunately, but it's in my blood now. So I'm certainly not doing it to get rich. I'm doing it because it's what my passion is. Yeah, radio was the thing for a minute. Yeah. Music music was the thing. Rock rock was the thing. Then it was rap. And we, we go through cycles. Uh, wrestling. Remember, wrestling was the shit. Magic. Med, remember, magic was the sh thing for a minute. Yep. Chris Angel. And there was a magic thing on every channel then we went to people in alaska was a thing just for smelly chubby people from alaska with fucked up teeth were a thing <laughs> crab fishing was a thing yeah we just go through this in comedy right now com comedians are rock stars man yeah and um and it goes in cycles it goes up and down i mean when we came up you know, radio and stand up was a kind of mesh. You know, when you got those like Opie and Anthony, and you know, when I was in Boston, um, like uh, the BCN comedy riot, the comedy and, and radio have always gone together because radio guys always brought comics on to make the show fun, have a good time. Uh, you know, because radio guys, you guys look what you guys do is nuts. You have to talk for hours every day about new stuff. You know, uh, that, that's a hard gig. You know, I just got, I'm the new host on the bonfire with Big J mm -hmm. to do two hours, four days a week, man. You gotta, you gotta have your shit together. So it's, it's, uh, it's kind of the same thing. Uh, but you know, you know, like comedy right now is on fire, dude. These guys are doing arenas, arenas. They're playing with Jovi plays. You know what I mean? I mean, where where uh, Pearl Jam plays, there's a guy going out there by himself or a, a girl going out there by himself with a microphone telling jokes. So it's at the pinnacle right now. So hopefully it dies and all that falls apart and we go back to being punk rock again. <laughs> What's the largest crowd you've performed for? 20,000. Oh my gosh. Yeah, I did. Well, it was with Dane. I did <laughs> 17,000 last year on the... Dennis Leary comics come home uh, at the garden. Um, it, you know, it's funny because it's, it's, 
it's you're not really doesn't matter, dude. You know, you go out there. The first time I did it, I was like, oh my God. But then you're just telling jokes mm -hmm. and you can't really, you just hear them laugh. Um, I prefer, I prefer 200 or less. Yeah. Yeah, dude, that, that's comedy. To me, that's comedy. When you're in a room and the ceilings are low and it's 200 people jammed in to see you and you make them laugh, you can hear that lady laughing at the joke more. This guy, that lady didn't like it. This guy is fucking snorting. That's, you know, it's like jazz. That's when you're hearing it. And you're in a big arena. It's like, you don't know. It's just, it's like a wave of, of whatever. You don't, you can't see anybody. You can't talk to anybody. You're going out there and do it. It's awesome. It's great for your ego. You feel like uh, Eddie Vedder. Yeah. But it's not as um, fulfilling to me as like a club, like, you know, uh, you know, Mothership when I was there the other week or the Comedy Cellar. Yeah. You go out and you make those people laugh. It hits you like a, it hits you like a punch in the face when you get them, which is a lot of comedy shows in my day. I've never been to an arena show and, and I don't think I ever will either because I've been to theater shows, Robert. And like, while yeah. they can be funny, you, you lose touch with the comedian. And that's why that 200 room venue with low ceilings is so important is because there's an intimacy there. Like versus yeah. being Seinfeld yeah. from the balcony or David Cross from the, the back of the Paramount Theater, you just, you kind of lose touch and it's hard to stay focused. Well, that, yeah, those things are money grabs, dude. That's a, <laughs> that's, that's so they can make money. Yeah. Especially because your fans are in the back row. Cause they didn't, you know, the front row is uh, stupid agents and rich people, you know, the VIPs that can afford that ticket. Yep. That's why I love when Lovey, Louie did his tour and Louie did his tour he bought a ticketing company and I believe he made all the tickets 40 bucks. <laughs> so at Creek in the cave from yeah. like, I don't know, 10 feet away. You're friends with the guy. He helped you with, uh, with your kill box show that came out in October. Hilarious by the way, who any, for anybody who hasn't checked it out just yet to get to see Louie, who is one of the great comedic uh, comedic times of uh, minds of all time. Yeah. It was something special. And I was appreciative that he would do something like that for fans. Well, that, yeah, well, that's where comedy, you have to make comedy. You can't make comedy in an arena. You have to make comedy in a very small, intimate room because you need to know if it works. If it works there, it'll work anywhere, mm -hmm. you know? Um, so, yeah, Creek in the Cave. I did that at Moon Tower, too. It's like that room alone is like, wow, this room's awesome. <laughs> the fact that you have that room, you have the other, was it Cobbs? Yeah. Uh, which, you know. Oh, uh, no, it's. um. What is it? Uh, Cap City. Need a room. So you have Vulcan. Cap City, you have the Val Reed of them, you have the uh, uh, the uh, gas company Vulcan, you have uh, now you have Mothership, which two rooms, yeah, you guys are uh, you guys are loaded in, man. You are a Boston guy, as we've talked about, which means yeah. that you're a Boston sports fan. You guys have uh, had uh, more good fortune and more successes than any other city this century. But it's been a rough couple of weeks for you guys with the Bruins setting a regular oh. season NHL record for points expected to win it all. They lose in the oh. first round in the Celtics. What's going on in Beantown? I mean, look, man, you can't, I mean, what are you going to do? You can't, you can't have it. We had it. I mean, we had a really good 10 year run. I mean, we were just killing it. So what are you going to, you know, what are you going to do, man? I mean, the Bruins that sucked. Yeah. yeah I mean, 59 seconds left. And they score a goal, and it's and from that team, I don't care if it was from Montreal, I, it would have felt better. Just, <laughs> ugh. Well, how long have they been in the league? Uh, six months? How long? <laughs> you know what I mean? I don't know, dude. You know, I love Cam Neely too. He's a friend of mine. Uh. It, it that sucked. It sucked. And the Sixers, ugh. I, you know why I'm so mad about the because Big J, who's my um, co-host on Bonfire, he's a big Sixers fan, and every time they win, he plays that stupid Sixers song. <laughs> one, two, three, four, five, Sixers, ten, nine, eight, seven, eight, Sixers. I want to literally jump off a building when I hear that song. It makes me sick. Yeah, I talked well, to Big J a few weeks ago, including about his love of Philadelphia teams, but also the, the psychopaths that exist in that fan base 
Boston has some crazies too. I'm assuming you've been to a fair share of live games. Yeah. Your sports loving lifetime. What's the maybe the craziest, worst slash best thing that you've seen out of Boston fans being at a game? Well, look at Boston fans are violent people. We're not good people. Um, but you know, New York fans aren't either. I mean, I've lived in New York for 20 years. And I learned you have to learn how to be around them. That's it. You have to learn tricks. Like I used to go, uh, I think it was in a um what was it 2003 in the playoffs, Yankees, Red Sox, mm-hmm. uh, Aaron fucking Boone year, I believe. Mm-hmm. Uh, I had I I I got playoff tickets and I went to the game and I sat in the bleachers. But here's what I did. I wore my Red Sox jersey underneath and I put a jacket on. And I sat down, I talked to everybody around me. I was like, hey man, where are you from? Oh, that's cool. Yeah, this and that. And, oh, yeah, your family. Oh, they're not, oh, that's cool. Yeah, I met everybody all around me. I bought a guy a beer. I was like, yeah, man, it's on me. And when the game started, I opened my shirt and they were like, oh, what the? F-? I was like, too late. I already know you, Gary. Your daughter's name's Sarah. She's three. I know you. I got you a beer. We're already friends, fuckface. And they, <laughs> They were like, all right, all right. And then when other Yankee fans would come up, be like, leave him alone. He's a good one. And they protected me. You just got to know how to deal with these people. You know? Oh, that is brilliant. So it's oh, yeah. a little bit. You tell me this before we start recording, but your son is a fan of at least one Tampa team. Okay, oh, here's Boston the deal. Team. Talk about radio, guys. Mike Calta, who is uh, uh, number one radio guy in Tampa, morning guy in Tampa. He's huge millions. You know, he's just the top, you know, top. He's a Tampa Bay fan and they got Brady because Tampa Bay. I mean, I think like eight years ago, you get a ticket for $3 to go to the game like months out. I mean, you could, you could hear during the game, like three people applauding driving by the stadium. It was terrible. Then they got Tom Brady and they get whipped up. So my son, just got into football with Tom Brady and then he left and he loves Tom Brady. And then my friend knew he loved Tom Brady. So my friend, Mike Calta, my number one best friend sent him around $500 worth of Tom Brady, Tampa Bay gear, flip flops, hats, jerseys, jackets, everything Now you send, you send a, you know, what was he? Six at that time. He's six. He flee- so he made him a Tom Brady fan. He made him a Tampa Bay Bucks fan, which made me sick to my stomach. So, because I had to watch the Bucks game on Sunday mm-hmm. with Tom Brady, with and my they son. The, they were better than the Patriots too. The all Patriots. right, all right, okay, 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 all right, all right, relax. Yes, they were. They were okay. Whatever. I know it wasn't Belichick. It was Brady. Well, it kind of wasn't. Okay, well, together they made Voltron. Apart, they're not. Okay, Brady walked into the, oh my, the goods. And I still love Brady, but the good thing is, now that Brady's gone, guess who's back? My son. I went and bought him all Patriots gear. All, because he's still pliable, because he doesn't know who he is yet. You know what I mean? I don't even know, you know, he, he, he uh, he could transition still if he wanted to. So I'm molding him. I'm molding him into a Patriots fan. See, I get that. I've got a six-year-old son at home right now, Robert. And we watch, we actually watched a lot of football this last season. It's his first year to really get into football. But he's telling me right now that soccer is his favorite sport, which I'm trying to be patient with him while also nudging him in the direction of the real sports that exist out there. Yeah, listen, tell him you got to get him. Look, my son just got into lacrosse. I mean, what is that yuppie Yale sh- crap? I got to go to, I, I, you know what I mean? I mean, we, he was in baseball, which I love. There's nothing like going to your son's baseball game. You get your chair out in center field. I'd sit away from the parents. I'd be out there the game. Nice day. Now I got to go lacrosse game. I don't even know what the hell they're doing, but I mean, what are you going to do? Listen, soccer, he did soccer for a second, and I, I I, got him out of that. There's no way I'm going. I am not going to a soccer game. I, I look at God bless 
Europe and the rest of the world. I know it's the biggest sport in the world. I know Ryan Reynolds and the guy from Sonny bought a team. They're trying to get us into it because they want the world to be one place. But the thing that America, the reason why we're the best and will always be the best, no matter what anybody else does, is because we got baseball and we got football and we got hockey. That's our sports. That's it. There's no soccer. Lacrosse is, I'm going to get him out of that. Soon as he can, as soon as his mom lets him play a little football, get into football and wrestling. That's it. But he does go to jujitsu. He takes Igor Gracie, which I'm happy about. And he plays the saxophone. <laughs> I told him you can play the saxophone, but he plays drums too. Like you can't just play the sax. You're not you're not in the Simpsons. You got to play drums. So he plays <laughs> drums. He does saxophone, and then he does um, jujitsu, and he does lacrosse. So. Yeah, if soccer ever considers changing its offside rule, which is a stupid rule, especially you can't have a single leg hair past that last defender, otherwise it's an offsides. If they consider changing that to allow for a little bit more goal scoring, I will consider it as a secondary sport. But until yeah. then, I'm sorry, you get my attention once every four years, and I root for America, which means I'm not going to be rooting for the World Cup the entire way through either. Yeah, it's just like, dude, I've been watching this game for three hours, and there's, there's, what what is a nil? What's a nil? I don't want to deal with nils. <laughs> Just I want to. I want. I want contact. And then when they get they get hit by a something a half a half a kick, they go down like they were shot. Mm -hmm. It's like get up. What is this acting? Oh, <laughs> fuck, forget you, dude. Meanwhile, we're watching football, and there's a 360 pound man running full speed at a 180 pound man with a ball. That's that's football. That's football. The other thing, I don't know, whatever. I know the world hates us for that too. They really they really hate us that we don't like their sport and we call it we call it soccer. <laughs> Look, stop celebrating ties and maybe we'll give you a little bit uh, more respect. You and your sport a little bit more respect. Oh, but a tie stinks. Yeah. It really does. 2-2. Two, two. Oh good. They're good. That that's fun. Thanks. I just I just screamed for two hours. I have no voice. I'm exhausted. Half these people are shit faced, and they're gonna fight in the parking lot out because they're hooligans. <laughs> and it, they, it's a tie. I don't get it. God bless them. God bless them. But that's not us. He is Robert Kelly. Check him out. Uh, well, you probably don't have much of a chance to check him out. Tickets are limited at this point. But go to ComedyMothership.com for the few tickets that may remain. Also, do make sure to check out his newest comedy special, Killbox. Came out last October. It is hilarious. You can access that through RobertKellyLive.com. Robert, always a pleasure, man. Thank you so much for the time today. Buddy, great talking to you. And hopefully I'll see you this weekend coming up. Thanks to Gentleman Jesus for the intro and outro music. Hear more of his work at GentlemanJesus.com. Thanks to you for hanging out. For more of the show and to connect on social media, visit BooksOnPod.com. We'll talk to you next time on Books on Pod. <laughs>